thank you very much for that introduction. This is my very first visit to the University of West London. So I would really like to thank uh, Professor Krivoy for the invitation to speak to you all this evening. Let me begin with an interesting quote from Stephen Leacock regarding the utility of university lectures. In 1922, Mr. Leacock wrote, most people tire of a lecture in 10 minutes. Clever people can do it in five. Sensible people never go to lectures at all. <laughs> of course, I do not agree with Mr. Leacock's statement, but I do think that the real value of university lectures is determined by what the students do with the information that has been imparted to them. The best law students will do further research on the subject matter, whereas the average law student will just rely on the notes taken during the lecture. Very frequently, law courses have a textbook. Furthermore, all our, our lectures, without exception, are based on research, and you will always be able to find further information in books, law journals, and so on. So if you want to be one of the top law students, I suggest you do your own research. Let's get started. I've been asked to, to talk to you about the notion of alternative dispute resolution, which is perhaps one of the most interesting subjects in the area of law, and without a doubt, a gigantic step forward in relation to the way in which disputes are currently being handled, not only in England and Wales, but also in several other common law countries. In these countries, there has been a change in the paradigm of the traditional justice system. I am referring in particular to the civil justice system. The shape of civil justice, as Professor Hazel Gain would put it, is permeated by non-jurisdictional practices to the extent that courts have become the primary sponsors of alternatives to the old-fashioned system. As a result, we lawyers have been making use of a wide array of mechanisms that are more efficient in terms of time, costs, and more importantly, with respect to the overall performance concerning the parties and their degree of satisfaction with the functioning of these mechanisms. What I intend to do this evening is to show you that we have moved into a new epoch where the role of lawyers is no longer limited to the execution of court-related activities. The new generation of lawyers should be in a position to know and sufficiently understand the various forms of, of decision-making, and litigation, to be sure, is only one of them. Some suggest that uh, the role of lawyers has changed from that of a gladiator to that of a problem solver. Accordingly, it may be argued that the best lawyer is not necessarily the one who wins most cases, but rather the one who's able to provide the best legal advice, that is, the one that better satisfies the client's needs. As we go to, through this lecture, uh, I hope to be able to demonstrate the importance of this new approach. The title of my lecture is Alternative Dispute Resolution and Access to Justice. The topic is timely, given that uh, uh, in, in the last 30 decades, uh, especially, but not exclusively, in common law countries, we've seen a remarkable trend towards uh, the utilization of different mechanisms within the mainstream of the practice of law. In England and Wales, for example, ADR mechanisms has been, uh, have been uh, met methodically integrated into the civil justice system. Active case management practices allow the courts to encourage the parties to make use of alternatives to litigation where appropriate, and the parties are expected to positively, positively respond to the court's encouragement. Within the European Union, for instance, ADR mechanisms have been methodically integrated uh, as part of the function of the internal market. And the idea was enshrined, actually, in the Lisbon Treaty and culminated in a series of different outcomes that are currently visible within member states. Owing to the limited time available, I will only introduce the topic of alternative dispute resolution and access to justice. I will provide a brief overview of the renewed interest in the use of alternatives to litigation and contextualize this phenomenon within the scope of the relationship between what I call jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional justice. First, I'll be looking at the notion of alternative dispute resolution and some closely related concepts. Then I will I'll be examining the relationship between ADR and access to justice. Finally, I'll touch upon the idea of practicing law in the interest of justice. And perhaps we can leave any, any questions you may have uh, till the end of uh, this lecture. So let's now look at the notion of alternative dispute resolution and some closely related concepts. 
The notion of ADR seems to have been first introduced by Professor Frank Sander of Harvard Law School, and, and, and Yadig is a Harvard man, in a talk entitled Varieties of Dispute Processing back in 1976 at the Pound Conference, which has been described as the starting point of the ADR movement. In the United States, the Pound Conference has also been described as the beginning of a serious attack on the civil justice system. The satisfaction with the civil justice system is clearly not novel at all, but this conference, and in particular Professor Ta Sanders' talk, ended up generating a lot of debate about future policy on dispute processing. At the Pound Conference, Professor Sanders spoke, among other things, about the whole spectrum of alternatives available, and very briefly about the idea of a dispute resolution center, later called um, the multi-door courthouse, an institution in which disputes would be finally settled or resolved through the most appropriate methods. In the 1980s, Professor Sander, as well as other scholars, wrote about the notion of alternative dispute resolution in much more detail. During this decade, the initials ADR began to be used in a more or less consistent fashion, and nowadays, the initialism has become part of the legal terminology. ADR, in simple terms, refers to the idea of exploring and, where appropriate, utilizing different means other than litigation, particularly in those cases where litigation would not, see, would not seem to be the best option. ADR mechanisms, therefore, are not intended to replace the traditional justice system, but to complement it by developing a more sophisticated dispute management system. This groundbreaking system includes but is not limited to litigation, thereby enhancing the number of remedies available to the parties. The aim is, as Professor Sander would state it, to reserve the courts for the settlement of those cases that truly require a judicial decision and to employ the most suitable mechanism for either settling or resolving those cases in which a judicial decision is not indispensable. In some common law countries, this new justice system has been systematically put into practice through a series of civil justice reforms. These reforms resulted in the establishment of both court-referred and court-annexed programs, whereby litigants are encouraged to either settle or resolve their disputes without actually having to litigate the matter. In some cases, participation in these programs is, is mandatory, whereas in some other cases, participation is voluntary. The question of mandatory versus, mand uh, mandatory versus voluntary participation in ADR is in itself controversial, and neither approach has indisputably proved to be superior to the other. So we, we don't really have time to, to go into complexities because this is just an introduction. But the truth of the matter is that participation in ADR is taking place. Enthusiasm for ADR has been tremendous. The rationale behind ADR is that it can facilitate access to justice, which, according to Professor Sander, is one of the main objectives of the ADR movement. The idea is to engage the parties in mediation, arbitration, or any other non-jurisdictional mechanism that is suitable for them so that the matter can be either settled or resolved in a more effective manner. This innovative line of thought has engendered some controversy, but there are more supporters in favor of this uh, proposition than there are detractors. Throughout this lecture, I have deliberately distinguished between the terms settlement and resolution. The reason being that, strictly speaking, the concept of settlement or dispute settlement is related to the idea of third-party decision-making, whereas the concept of resolution or dispute resolution has to do with the idea of joint decision-making. This distinction, of course, casts certain doubts on the adequacy of the term alternative dispute resolution, in the sense that if we discriminate between the concepts of settlement and resolution, it would also be necessary to separate the notion of alternative dispute settlement from the notion of alternative dispute resolution. Professor Carrie Menkel Meadow, one of the most prominent scholars in the area of ADR, prefers the expression appropriate dispute resolution in the sense that it embraces a wide array of problem solving mechanisms, including dispute settlement and dispute resolution techniques. Nevertheless, it can be said that the expression alternative dispute resolution is the one that has gained widespread acceptance worldwide. The globalization of the alternative dispute resolution movement is beyond description.
and I believe that such an expression is not likely to be replaced in the foreseeable future. I personally don't have a problem with the use of the term alternative, as a noun it refers to something that is different from something else, especially from what is usual and offering the possibility of choice. And as an adjective, it concerns a method that you can use if you do not want to use another one. My only problem is that the expression alternative dispute resolution is technically insufficient to account for the concepts of dispute settlement and dispute resolution. And I think that semantics uh, are fundamental to understanding the underlying significance of the main forms of decision making. The distinction between dispute settlement and dispute resolution methods is important because the so-called ADR mechanisms can be divided into two categories, namely dispute settlement and dispute resolution mechanisms. Perhaps an additional category might be added to incorporate the concept of dispute prevention, but for the purposes of this lecture, I shall only consider the first two approaches. Let me give you a couple of examples. Arbitration, and I believe that you've been talking about arbitration for a while, and if, if you haven't, you will. Um, it's a dispute settlement mechanism in which an impartial third party called the arbitrator participates to settle the matter by way of an award. Mediation, on the other hand, is a dispute resolution mechanism in which a third party called the mediator attempts to help the parties to resolve their dispute by means of a negotiated agreement. In other words, in arbitration, the parties confer decision-making power on one or more arbitrators who will decide the dispute for them, whereas in mediation, the parties bring in someone who will help them to make their own decision. Unlike arbitrators, mediators do not have decision-making power, just the expertise in giving people a helping hand. Perhaps another way to explicate the differences between mediation and arbitration is by looking at the civil law distinction between obligations of means, also known as uh, obligations of conduct, and obligations of result. In mediation, as indicated earlier, the mediator has an obligation to endeavour to help the parties to reach an agreement, whereas in arbitration, the arbitrator has an obligation to render an award. In this sense, the mediator's obligation is an obligation of means, that is, an obligation to strive for an outcome that, if achieved, will resolve the dispute, while the arbitrator's obligation is an obligation of result, viz. an obligation to deliver an outcome that serves to settle the dispute. When we talk about ADR mechanisms, however, it is important to remember that there are numerous types of dispute settlement and dispute resolution methods. Arbitration and mediation are probably the most commonly used forms of ADR, but there is a plethora of dispute settlement and dispute resolution devices that can be as useful as arbitration and mediation. These include, for example, and they are in, in the little booklet I've just given you, conciliation, construction adjudication, dispute boards, early neutral evaluation, expert determination, mini trial, negotiation, negotiated rule making, neutral expert facts finding, ombudsman, private judging, and summary jury trial, and so on. But it also encompasses tailor-made or systematically designed settlement and dispute resolution mechanisms. No single dispute resolution or dispute settlement mechanism can be seen as a panacea. When selecting an ADR mechanism, we need to delve into several factors, such as the nature of the dispute, the relationship between the parties, the interests of the parties, the amount in dispute, costs, speed, etc. In 2010, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators published a little manual, the one I've just given you, in which the main ADR categories are concisely examined. This publication has been translated, I think, so far into several different languages, but I suggest you have a quick look at it at some point if you have time, so that you can have an idea of how these mechanisms actually work. In a more recent publication, I believe it's just there, this is a copy of that publication, my, one of my colleagues and I shed some light on the notion of online dispute resolution. He reviews a series of studies on the use of e-negotiation, e-mediation, and e-arbitration. ODR is, is without a doubt a captivating area of research, and if you are interested in this topic, I recommend that you read this publication. In my opinion, the study of ADR mechanisms is as important as the study of litigation. Why is it important? Well, it is important because the law student who only focuses on litigation as a means of dispute settlement without regard to other methods, can be deemed as fully qualified as the medical student 
who solely concentrates on the study of surgery as the only option for the treatment of a given disease. As Professor Sanders says, how would you feel about a doctor who suggested surgery without exploring all the choices, particularly when you know that there are various causes of treatment? This observation is, in a sense, analogous to that of a lawyer who advises his client to litigate the matter without considering uh, other options. So let's now turn to the central theme of this lecture, which is the notion of alternative dispute resolution as a means of improving access to justice. The link between the use of alternatives to litigation and the notion of access to justice was first made by Professor Mauro Capelletti shortly before Professor Sanders' talk was published. The ADR movement was conceived within the framework of the Access to Justice project, which is perhaps one of the greatest legacies of Professor Mauro Capelletti. It was the largest research project ever carried out in this area, and the encouragement of alternatives to the core system was a landmark in the theoretical conception of access to justice. Professor Capelletti spoke of a broader conception of access to justice, which was not necessarily tantamount to the concept of access to court. The new access to justice approach called for the exploration of alternatives to the traditional justice system, and it also promoted imaginative access to justice reforms. The sentiments of this broader conception of access to justice are, in the words of Professor Sackville, capable of meaning different things to different people. There is little room for discussion, I think, with regard to the meaning of the word access, but the same cannot be said about the meaning of the word justice. The concept of justice has been dissected for centuries, and yet no consensus has been reached as to what it actually means. It would be preposterous, of course, to say that in today's lecture we will be able to put an end to this long-standing debate, but I will make an attempt to articulate my insights into the meaning of this provocative concept. At the risk of oversimplifying, I will argue that justice, estricto sensu, is nothing more than a complex ideal relating to the maintenance and restoration of social order. In this context, social order may be defined as the pattern of approved behavior that is necessary to guarantee peaceful coexistence. In addition, I will also argue that the expression access to justice, lato sensu, is closely linked with the right or the opportunity to make use of one or more mechanisms that are suitable for maintaining and restoring social order. It should be noted that our vision of access to justice is not restricted to a one-way approach. I'll explain what I mean in a moment. Access to justice, therefore, in the sense described here, does not equate with access to court. I don't dispute that access to court gives you access to justice, but if we see justice as an ideal or as a destination, we will find that there are multiple avenues towards the attainment of justice. From this point of view, the notion of alternative dispute resolution can be understood as part of a superhighway whose final destination is justice. Thus, the question of how to get to justice, for the most part, is a matter of choice, and our role is precisely to help our clients to make an informed choice. For some reason, however, there's always been a tendency to confuse the concept of access to justice with the concept of access to court. Let me explain this. Any dispute could be defined as a perceived violation of a normative expectation of behavior. Traditionally, lawyers were trained to deal with such a breach by initiating court proceedings. Consequently, litigation became a sort of default mechanism for imploring a final determination or a decision concerning the violation of a given norm. But research shows that in common law countries, the vast majority of cases that are taken to court are not disposed of by full litigation. In a great number of them, the parties negotiate an agreement which, I would argue, gives them a sense of closure based upon the recognition that justice has been done. It would be a mistake to think of negotiated agreements as something contrary to the idea of justice. These agreements are more likely to be voluntarily complied with than a judgment. And what's more, these types of agreements are allowed by law, so they are literally as legitimate as, if not more legitimate than, a judgment. The use of negotiation as a means of bringing an end to court proceedings has been labelled by Professor Mark Gallanter as litigation. Without deprecating the importance of litigation, 
Professor Gallanter explains that in the United States, for example, lawyers spent more time negotiating than litigating. And this situation is more or less the same in some other common law countries. This suggests that the parties are not necessarily looking for a judgment, let alone that the parties unequivocally associate justice with judgment. This also suggests that if the notion of justice is connected with the idea of maintaining or restoring social order, particularly in those cases where the violation of social order arises in the context of a dispute, it would be logical to conclude that justice, justice can be achieved in several different ways. It is clear that disputes can be settled or resolved without having to go to court, and our legal system enables us to do that. The myth that the parties want to have their day in court is based upon the assumption that litigation is the only way to tackle their problems, but in most instances, it simply sets the scene for an agreement to be reached. Litigation is a time-consuming exercise that, more often than not, has devastating consequences for the parties, not only financially, but also emotionally and even physically. Litigation, in reality, is actually far from exciting, and therefore, no sensible person would ever be looking forward to having the day in court. I am not in any way calling into question the value of litigation. Before I became a full-time researcher, I was actually a litigator, and I was also an assistant professor of civil litigation. And I passionately actually taught my students how to succeed in court. The very idea of bringing cases to court, or the notion of settling disputes by means of litigation, therefore, is not necessarily anachronistic. Litigators represent disputes as cases, and there are certain cases that are expected to be brought to court. These cases are supposed to be decided by the state in exercise of its jurisdictional function. In most situations, however, the parties can employ all the mechanisms to either settle or resolve the disputes. I say in most situations because there are certain matters that for public policy reasons can neither be settled nor resolved out of court. In light of the observations made earlier, one could make a distinction between jurisdictional justice and non-jurisdictional justice. In essence, both concepts are inextricably linked with the idea of maintaining or restoring social order. The former refers to the pursuit of justice through the courts, whereas the latter concerns the idea of justice without courts. Social order is a, is a reasonable aspiration, and our legal system has been designed to achieve such a goal. The traditional justice system is a fundamental part of any civilized society, but the truth is that it cannot cope with every single dispute that arises in our society. For this reason, we have to make sure that our system is actually used in an intelligent manner. We cannot continue to assume that litigation is the only way. The indiscriminate use of courts can be detrimental to the future of our traditional justice system. Judicial congestion, together with the vicissitudes of this undesirable phenomenon, may be the end result of an abhorrent predisposition to litigate, and we lawyers are partly to blame for this. I say partly because uh, the number of cases that can be taken to court within the ambit of the civil justice system, as Professor Hayes again has pointed out, is practically infinite. Neither policymakers nor lawyers seem to have developed a systematic criterion as to what needs or does not need to be decided in court. Hence, I would argue that perhaps we have misused our traditional justice system. I would also argue that the justice system as a whole includes both jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional mechanisms, and it is crucial that we deploy these resources accordingly. Litigation is not an all-purpose device for the settlement of disputes. In most cases, I would argue that resolution is preferable to settlement even in those cases where it would be more appropriate to use, to, to use a dispute settlement mechanism, I believe that we have a duty to take account of the options available. I am not suggesting that litigation be abolished. What I'm trying to say is that litigation should be used in a more strategic way. Examples include the need to consider cases where a precedent is required, matters concerning constitutional and statutory interpretation, cases involving the specificity of court remedies, etc. Strategic use of dispute settlement and dispute resolution procedures presupposes a, a new mindset, but it also demands a new, uh, addi an additional set of skills. ADR has become a new discipline. The literature is so vast 
that substantial effort would be needed to identify, survey, and digest the most relevant information. That's why I disagree with the statement that sensible people never go to lectures at all. Because without the right guidance, it would be very difficult to know where to start. I say the right guidance because there are hundreds of courses offered under the label of alternative dispute resolution. But what is actually taught in these courses is actually something rather different. To conclude, let me now touch upon the idea of practicing law in the interest of justice. Take me only one minute. Professor Carrie Menkel Meadow has written extensively about the ways in which we might teach ADR. And I would like to think, after having read uh, some of her publications, that uh, when we teach ADR, we're doing the right thing. That is, we teach the new generation of lawyers to practice in the interest of justice or towards the achievement of justice. To practice in the interest of justice is to do with the possibilities of achieving justice in a variety of different ways. To practice in the interest of justice is simply to understand that in some cases, social order can be maintained and restored through both coercive and non-coercive mechanisms. It is merely to recognize that there are different paths to justice. I hope that my simile of the superhighway will give you uh, an idea of what this involves. Because this room is full, I can see that in your faces are full good law students. I also hope that after this lecture, you will be doing further research into the many ways in which justice can be done. I further hope that in the near future, you will all be practicing law in the interest of justice. I would like to conclude by saying one more time that the civil justice system comprises both jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional mechanisms. All these mechanisms fulfill an important function in the maintenance and restoration of social order. Each of them has been created to meet certain societal needs. I am convinced that the new generation of lawyers can be equipped to make better use of the civil justice system. I am also convinced that sooner or later, lawyers will be able to provide their clients with more accurate information concerning litigation, ADR mechanisms, and more importantly, the best access to justice route. It's been a, a, great, uh, a great pleasure to address you all this evening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yarik, for the invitation. And uh, I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you so much. <laughs>